Hello and welcome to 10 awesome megalithic sites from around the world. We're going to be showing you our choice of the biggest, the oldest, the heaviest, the weirdest, the you name itest from all over the planet that aren't Gebekli Tepe or Stonehenge or quite a few other places you may have heard of. So settle in and prepare to be amazed as we take you on a whistle-stop tour of some of the world's most mysterious places that you're ever likely to see. First up, it's Dolman's Gym, but not as we know them. In our first stop, we boldly go to Spain's Costa del Sol and the oldest site in this show, the colossal Dolmen Domenga. There are several reasons why uh, I think, Rupert, this gets it into our list, not only just onto the list, but uh, being first on the list because it is the um, mostest in several regards. I think... I think it's the <laughs> oldest uh, monument that we've got on the list, though I think you may, might dispute that a bit later on. Uh, I might, but it's certainly, well, it, it's certainly right up there, isn't it? We know yeah. that, yeah. This is definitely the largest megalithic site monument, call it what you will, in Andalusia, in the whole of the, the Andalusian peninsula. Um it is probably one of the largest on the, largest on the list as well. Anyway, mm. we probably better talk about more about what it is exactly that we're talking about. I said uh, in the introduction there, so that it's a dolmen gym, but not as we know it. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, the word dolmen on the continent has slightly different connotations to the way that we would use the word dolmen. It's a more generic term on the continent for <clears throat> um, uh, megalithic sites, uh, we would use it um, more to do with these more open structures, little smaller structures, uh, um, uh, you know, with a single capstan on top, you know, with minimum of two, but more usually three stones supporting it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll be talking more about uh, dolmens in that kind of way later on. Uh, but no, here at the Dolmen de Menga, we've got something more like what we'd call a, a passage grave, something like that. Is that... Yes, I think that's fair. Passage fair tomb. Passage yeah. tomb. So, mm -hmm. you know, yes, we've got capstans and we've got supporting uh, things, but um, we've got an enclosed tomb here. That the tomb, we say tomb, that's what we presume about it, but with massive stones in this case used to support it. Got a really long passage uh, with colossal stones on either side supporting huge capstans uh, o over the top. Do you know what? <clears throat> I've been to Malaga on the Costa del Sol a couple of mm -hmm. times. And I didn't know this place was here. <laughs> oh, man, if only I'd known. It's yeah. just 30 miles north of, uh, of Malaga, up there beyond the mm -hmm. hills on the sort of um, uh, plain behind. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll definitely be going there when we make our film, won't we? Because I We think most definitely will. But isn't it it's funny you could say that about... You could probably say it about almost anywhere in the world, that unless you know about prehistoric sites being yeah. here, there, and, you know, you, you could go on holiday somewhere and not have a clue yeah. that you were within a few miles of something truly ancient. Yeah, it's but true. this is on our list because it is colossally mm. important and I think will turn mm. out to be colossally important in terms of uh, yeah. large communities doing, you know, uh, extraordinary business to do with the Mediterranean and the Mediterranean trade to the at Atlantic, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. More of that, you know, in another place, in another time, perhaps. The date we're talking about is 3700 BC. That's the earliest date that uh, we've got from uh, C14 uh, for the construction mm. uh, of it. It is slightly debatable, um, but it falls into um, what you can... Uh, deem from the other structures around, talking of the other structures around, um, Dolmen de Menga is one of uh, collective, what is collectively known as the Dolmens uh, de Antiquera. And uh, there are two others, the Dolmen de Viera and the Dolmen um, de, de, um, 
at uh, El Romaral. El Romaral, that's the one. Thank you so much. Mm. <laughs> Re- <laughs> rescued me there. <laughs> In terms of overall scheme, um, it's useful to kind of compare it to Newgrange. So yeah, this is five hundred. This is five hundred years before Newgrange was built, and mm. uh, as an aside, uh, twelve hundred years before. Um, Stonehenge went up, just a bit of, you know, chronological <laughs> the context reference, there. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, like Newgrange, we've got a large circular um, mound there. I think Newgrange mm. Mound may be bigger than this mound, but in uh, inside, in the passage, mm. it's a completely different story. Um, <clears throat> um, what is it? Newgrange uh, is... Uh, we have a passage at... Um, uh, a lamanga in inside is uh, is ninety foot long, and mm-hmm. it's twenty foot wide, and eleven foot high, and it's got supporting pillars on the inside to support the, the centres of those uh, massive um, capstones. Yeah. Newgrange, by comparison, is only the passage is only sixty three foot long. You know, it's two thirds of the length, but you know, to go down it is quite a narrow squeeze. Yeah, single file job down there, and you have to watch your head, as as I remember, going down. Uh, going you down. certainly do. Yeah, certainly yeah. Do. it's all right for short people like me. But uh, yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> so what Namanga represents in the area is an extraordinary effort by what must have been extraordinary a stra- extraordinary group of human beings. Um, uh, it, uh, for want of a better word, it is an extraordinary expression of monumentalism. Like mm. they knew what they wanted, they knew uh, that they were um, building for permanence mm. and for memory mm. and what have you. And the other extraordinary thing about this site that has it be special is it's always been an open site. Like it's always been known about. Not like so many megalithic sites, <clears throat> ancient megalithic sites, uh, being covered up in the past. Like Newgrange was not known about until it was rediscovered and excavated, <clears throat> um, you know, not so long ago. Uh, Doma de Manga has always been known about and always, it seems, been in use uh, for, for whatever uh, reason. So there's Upside to that and downside to that, you know, it, it's been preserved and it's still there and it's been known about. And there's more um, histographic information about it than many other sites. But at the other side, at the other end of that, it means it's been kept clean from an archaeological point of view. <laughs> well, that's true. Uh, yeah. But I, the thing that gets me about it is when you look at the scale of the the stones that have been used to put that together. The whole thing is just so monumental Mm. that it kind of, even though it has its similarities with the the other dolmens in the region, Mm. um, that just the scale of this, the building of this, must have it, it must have been for something that was way more important for those people. Um, it seems that way to me, anyway. Yeah, the fact yeah. that it's got a two hundred ton capstone, yeah, um, <clears throat> that's yeah immense on is every that, level. Is that is that the English ton or the metric ton? That's the English think, ton. It's it's uh, yeah, one hundred eighty me- metric tons, uh, two hundred. I, I have one hundred and fifty metric tons or um, thereabouts. Yeah. Do you? No, I yeah. have one hundred and eighty <clears throat> metric tons. On my yeah. uh, notes, but anyway, uh, w- whichever is the correct one, two hundred British tons is uh, uh, pretty is good. W- uh, I'm going to I refer read. to it's it a little bit uh, in metric tons here because it's what I've got, mm-hmm. and I can't do the mental arithmetic. But, but <laughs> the <laughs> total <laughs> weight of all those supporting stones and the capstones is about four hundred and eighty metric tons. Amazing. Sorry. Man. 840. Did I say 480? You said 480. No, 840. Not even similar. Yeah, yeah. The, um, 840 metric tons. Yeah, yeah. That's a yeah. lot. The, the five biggest stones incorporated are 44 tons, 51 tons, 68 tons, 87 tons, and 149 tons. Wow. 
There is a very good document. Um, well, uh, I think it's from the visitor center uh, at uh, Don Domingo uh, that shows or you know, how they think it may have been constructed, which actually is a nice very good film. and well studied um, um, thing. Um, <clears throat> So uh, I hope uh, you'd be able to have a look at that. It's quite informative about how um, megalithic monuments may have been built in the past anyway, you know, to see mm. this animation of, of groups of people moving stones about in that way. And, and the forethought and the planning that goes into these things is, uh, is phenomenal. Mm. The other special thing, before we wrap up on this one, which, you know, because there's so much to it, I think it's fair to give it a bit of breadth at the beginning, is its alignment. When we talk about alignment, we're almost certainly, you know, we're aiming at the, you know, sunrise or sunset on a particular day. This is unusual because it points sort of towards the solstice, but not. It's actually a few degrees north of, uh, of the solstice uh, alignment. What it's actually aligned on is a, a rock, um, a few, mo a couple of miles distant. Anyway, extraordinary rock. Looks like a face pointing out out of the out of the landscape, and it's pointing at a um, a cliff in this uh, edifice um, mm. where it's known that what well, there was Neolithic uh, activity in the past. It's called uh, mm. La Peña. Peña uh, de los enamorados, the well the the uh, the rock of the lovers. Uh, there's another story about that about two lovers, one Muslim, one uh, uh, one Christian. We're talking about 15th century here, uh, that were uh, chased on onto the rock and uh, leapt to de their death rather than face, um, yeah, sort of a Romeo and jo oh Juliet story, yeah, <laughs> which oh was well known, yeah. <laughs> But Apparently. I think it, it is, it's the only site, isn't it, in, out of all the, uh, uh, the dolmens in the region, isn't it the only one that doesn't point to a solstice or equinox? That's right, yeah, it points to this rock. Mm. And I think if you yeah. see the pictures here, you realise that this was, it must have been really, really very significant. In fact, at the base mm. of that rock, there are signs of Neolithic activity uh, going, you know, dating back to previous to uh, Dolmen de Menga. And mm. I don't know about your imagination, Rupert, when you've got a hundred foot cliff and stuff going on at the bottom of it, when we understand that things were not all uh, unicorns and rainbows in the Neolithic, uh, <laughs> you know, the, <laughs> mm. you wonder what may or may not have been going on. Yes. Anyway, yeah. on that um, uh, little bit of news or conjecture, mm. I think mm. um, that's about it, as much as we can tell you about uh, Dom Domenga uh, in this little 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 bit. Oh, the well. It's got a well. It's one of the few places that have got a well. I'd forgotten that. Yes, it does. The yes. problem with the well yeah. is that it can't be dated. It's not been mm. dated. And considering that it seems to have been in use from the year dot since it was built right up until now... Um, yeah, putting putting a date or uh, uh, asserting that it was built at the same time or put down at the same time as the tomb, as the dolmen. Um, yeah, we can't really go there. So mm. that's it, Dolmen de Manga. Um, yeah. Hope you enjoyed that bit. On to the next. Great sight, yeah. Well, next up, just how many monoliths does anybody need? We're going all the way over to Sulawesi in Indonesia for this site, where a surprising number of menhirs are clustered amongst the traditional Toraja houses. Or should I say that the traditional Toraja houses have been built around a surprising number of monoliths? Uh, uh, yes, so this is actually the site of Bori Kalumbwang uh, over on uh, uh, Sulawesi. And astonishingly, it comprises 102 menhirs. So, uh, and they're clustered... As I said in the intro, they're, they're clustered around these houses, or the houses are clustered around the stones. Nobody knows really how old they are. Um, the fact that they're megalithic in the way that they are, the fact that they are this clustered group of stones, they're reminiscent of some of the Portuguese stones, in fact, and African stones. It's, it's odd. And, and the other thing is that pretty much nothing 
is known about them. There's a certain amount of folklore. <laughs> Why are we bothering them? <laughs> well, the reason that we're bothering is because when you look at them, it's yeah. just so enigmatic that, uh, I mean, to be honest, that's the reason that I wanted to include them in this list because sometimes you see uh, sites that are so incongruous. They seem so out of phase with uh, with where they are. And it, yeah. it's that, really. It's these uh, almost perfectly cylindrical stones. Um, yeah. And I think it, we're sort of throwing this out, you know, to Indonesia to in, be inclusive as well, you know, to show uh, that monumentalism, use that word again, mm. um, you know, doesn't stop um, with the, with Europe and, uh, you know, mm. that we can go further afield and, and mm. find out what we can find out because, as you're just about to tell us, I'm sure, these uh, date to <laughs> much nearer the present than uh, well, it's, anything else on our list but it's thought again it's not known but it is yeah. thought that they're only about 500 years old and mm. so you, you you could also ask well why are we including them here and the reality is well they're prehistoric because there is no written history for this cultural aspect of anything in indonesia it's just weird mm. um but along with the uh the folklore that um, that goes with the stones, um, the height of each stone, they vary in height from, uh, I mean, uh, some of them are quite small, but the height of the stone is supposed to be indicative of how many water buffaloes were slaughtered for that particular funeral ceremony. And uh, this is the Toraja people, and the stories are that sometimes there would be hundreds of buffalo slaughtered at a funeral ceremony, um, oh. uh, which, you know, when you then look at the fact that there's 102 stones uh, in this site, and you think, oh, that's a lot of buffalo. That's a lot of buffalo. Um, yeah. Uh, Do we think, though, uh, is this is this site built up over time, or was it all put there in, in uh, at the same time? That's the interesting thing because it, if each of these stones represents a stat sacrifice, that mm. suggests to me that this site is actually built up over time. Yeah, and uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so unconvinced by the folklore. Uh, oh, right. Well, you know, when, when you, you look at the, the site, it's it's not at all higgledy-piggledy, is it? I mean, it, no. it, there's a randomness to it, but it's not higgledy-piggledy, if you see what I mean. You, you'll see from the pictures. But, <laughs> so, um, higgledy-piggledy is a technical term. It is a technical term. It yes. is. It's jargon. I apologise. Um, <laughs> But um, but that's uh, that's an interesting thing that w I think when you find any site that that even if it's if it looks a little bit random, there's still something cohesive about it, and mm. and so you think well it can't have been built up over a vast amount of time then because you know, there, there must have been some notion of how it was going to look. I, mm. it, it seems that way to me anyway. Uh, but uh, th th there are, uh, I mean, as I said, th 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 you're talking about thousands of uh, of buffaloes in total here. If they really were slaughtered in, you know, in these yeah. quantities. Uh, well, that's a fascinating thing for me about this side. I mean, you know, we, there's very little we can say definitively about the stones that themselves. Um, but what's more interesting is the relationship that people nowadays still have to those stones. So from an ethnographical perspective and, you know, the possibility, the, the fact that that is related opens up possibilities, opens up your minds to, mind to fresh possibilities for other megalithic monuments of, we may come across from whatever age they may, may be, not for a moment, suggesting we should transpose this uh, mythology or this uh, legend or this history, you know, or this memory to other sites elsewhere, but just a, it's a bit of a mind expander, you know, of the possible ways that people relate to them. <clears throat> yes. I mean, it is interesting that the Torajan people do have some pretty strange 
practices in relation to the dead. Uh, um, you know, they uh, will even bring their uh, their dead relatives out. They will bring the bodies out uh, on their birthdays, um, uh, which is a pretty bizarre thing. And in fact, in some cases, they will carry on bringing them out every year until they literally fall to pieces and they can no longer be <laughs> brought out. So, so their, their relationship... Uh, culturally, their relationship with death is is nothing like as standoffish, if you like, as, yeah, but uh, as the, but ours. That resonates with what we know of how uh, folk were in long barrows were being treated way back in the early Neolithic. Yeah, in uh, in in Britain at least. Yeah. It? Well, it it, yeah. it it certainly gives another possible. Uh, interpretation, if you like, of excarnation. You know, yeah, if, yeah. if if you're actually still relating to uh, the dead until they fall apart, <laughs> I think that's... Uh, we can laugh. We, we can yeah, laugh. we can. It's true, we can. Um, mm. But uh, there are... Uh, whilst this goes a little bit away from the stones, uh, there's one of the practices within this culture that I do find uh, very evocative is that... Uh, you have the stones that are really relating to the, uh, the the adult deceased. When babies died, they were put into coffins made of a particular kind of tree, uh, the Tara tree. And the reason that they used this particular kind of tree for babies is that when you cut into them, they give off so much white sap that spiritually they they saw this as replacing the mother's milk to feed the baby uh, into mm -hmm. the afterlife, mm -hmm. which is uh, that's, that's quite a lovely thing in the sadness, really, for me. Yeah, um, that's it. One of those incredible things in the whole set about the way people relate to their, yeah, uh, their yeah, environment and yeah. what they know. Um, I but, think that's about it. Though, yeah, Rupert, we, we can't yeah. tell you anything more about the stones other than, you know, you can see from the picture that, uh, you know, they're, uh, it's quite an extraordinary sight. And uh, you yeah, know, if you are yeah. visiting these places around the world, it's definitely worth a visit. Yeah, and I uh, hope you agree with us that uh, worthy of inclusion in our little list. Indeed. Be warned, you will suffer whiplash on this journey, both in time and space. We're yanking you away from Indonesia all the way to West Africa now. Did you know there are about a thousand stone circles in Gambia and Senegal? That's the highest concentration of stone circles in the world, by the way. And don't worry, we're not going to do all of them. Right, so let's talk about the Senegambian stone circles. Um, I suppose the first thing to do would be to establish where um, Senegambia is. Actually, it's not a political or a, a country region. It's a, just a geographical region, um, I think, between... Uh, the Senegal River in the north and the Gambia River in the south, right over in the, the west of Africa. Mm. Right, the headlight, I mentioned it, I think, in the little introduction there, uh, over a thousand stone circles. I've seen the number. It's staggering, isn't it? 1,053, to be precise, stone circles. Wow. Um, in, uh, in the whole of the region. It gets a bit complicated, though. You know, when um, sort of researching or reading what I have as far as I can do about the, these stone circles, is there's a lot, seems to be a lot of copying and pasting going on <laughs> <laughs> yeah. out there. And it gets confusing as to the numbers. Because if you go some places, it will tell you there are 93 stone circles in the Senegambian uh, group. And you think, what? I thought there were over a thousand. Well, there yes. are, there are, but the 93 refers to the stone circles in the four groups that were selected by UNESCO to be inscribed as World Heritage ah, Sites. That, okay, I didn't know yes, that. Yes, that. That, that solves that little uh, little conundrum there. Then 93 refers to those within the UNESCO thing, right. um, but the whole lot in the area, what is it? Um um oh gosh forgotten now um what the extent of the region that's right yeah yeah 12,000 square miles apparently um 
yeah, in an area 220 miles long and 62 miles wide. And that's got to hold a record, hasn't it? That's why, you know, to a large degree, it earned, they earn their place in uh, you know, extraordinary megalithic sites uh, of the world. Just it, simply, yeah. they are registered as the highest concentration of stone circles in the world. So but apart from that, it, they are unique in appearance. You know, I, I'll have put up some photographs, I'm sure, by now. Mm. And... Uh, folk will be able to see that the, the stones are unlike, very unlike, any from anywhere else. I can't think of uh, anywhere else in the, the world. I suppose the only thing that they reminded me of particularly was some of the sites in Portugal. Okay. Uh, uh, a slight similarity there, but it's a, it's a very superficial similarity. As yeah. you say, I mean, they're almost unique globally. They don't seem to be like very much else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't think of it. Well, I mean, to be precise about the stone, it's laterite. Am I correct mm. in that, geologically speaking? Yeah, so it's very rich in iron, yeah. so they all have a kind of reddish uh, colour to them. But I think it's also mm. very soft while well, still in the ground, mm. you know, sort of halfway between soil and rock, isn't it, <laughs> almost? Well, that's exactly what it yeah, is, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, I suppose its age will dictate how compressed and how rocky it is. Yeah, hence, uh, but, yeah. So, unlike so many other uh, megalithic sites you'll see, every single one of the st stones you can see has been worked to the shape you see it in. They are not glacial erratics lying around that people have gathered together in one place and put up. These have been deliberately chiselled uh, out of the uh, rock um, round about. Um, uh, moreover, with iron tools, which rather puts a compression on the date we can expect to see from here. So in the total breadth of uh, time that they represent, that they were put up within, the quoted number is about 1,500 years from 300 BC um, up to, what, 1,200 AD? Um, so something like that. But the concentration seems to be around about 800 AD. That seems to be when most have been, uh, been put up. So, you know, not in the great scheme of megalithic things, not that old. Um, older than the ones we were just talking about, has to be said. Um, mm. <clears throat> uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, relatively recent. It does raise questions there, though, doesn't it? You know, that uh, you know, a culture changes an awful lot mm -hmm. over uh, a thousand years or more. So it's like, well, what was the intention then, you know, when it comes that much further to history, towards history, what, uh, the same function as before? Well, they may be younger than other megalithic sites we're used to talking about, but they're no less mysterious in that. They don't have mm. an associated history, so mm. it's a question of, of anybody's guess. No, no doubt, you know, there's plenty of, of folklore uh, about them, but... Whether that's true or false, I don't know. The best mm. stab I've heard at it is that it's a pre-Islamic culture. Maybe um, the uh, the Ghanaian Empire culture, whatever that means, and probably mm. the availability of this particular rock meant you know that once they started doing it. They completed doing it. Interestingly, mm. though, the thing that really distinguished these, these um, stone circles, apart from what they're made of, is they're definitely uh, necropoli. Shall I put it? Is that a word? Necropoli? <laughs> it, absolutely, it is. Yeah. <laughs> they are associated unequivocally with burials. Um, so legends say, you know, they're related to past kings, uh, yeah. uh, tribal leaders, etc. Although there seems to be a mixture of type of burial. Apparently there are some mass burials where, you know, people have just been thrown into pits and there are more organised burials associated with them. So mm. what do you say? You, you take your pick. But the other staggering thing over the whole region, though, is, is the, the number of different types of monument, aren't there? Yeah. That if you count the mounds and everything else as well, it, how many thousand is it? It's, it's about 28,000, getting on for 30,000, yes. Yeah. just 
staggering. Yeah, in- including all the single stones, uh, double stones mm. to circles we, we've got as well. Uh, and you'll see mm. from the, the pictures, you know, these are in concentrated sites as well. Other unusual mm. things are the uh, V-shaped stones and the so-called lyre stones, which are sort of similar to the V-shaped stones. But those are, like I said, those have not come out of the ground like that. They've been carefully worked. And, you know, yeah, I say the rock is soft. That still represents an awful amount of work, you know, by a lot of people with a concentrated effort uh, getting to uh, what you can see. Um, mm. So, yeah, there are, all, there are a few interpretations, but actually getting to the bottom of it with authoritative uh, papers, results of digs, etc., I'm drawing a bit of a blank. Maybe I haven't been trying mm. hard enough. <laughs> um, but if you like a bit of a mystery, the Senegambian uh, Gambian stone circles um, are one it might be a good idea to get into. Um, mm. Yeah. So I, I don't think I can say much more than that with any uh, No, authority. I don't think there is that much more to be said. It's a funny thing with a, with a lot of, uh, across the whole of the continent of Africa, that it's surprising how uh, places have been excavated, mm. but in terms of sort of rigorous laboratory work after the event, you don't seem to find any at all to speak of. It, which is there have been digs, intriguing. but, you know, mm. but uh, the, the, the record of them or the report of them is pretty hard to hard to come by. That's probably why there's a lot of yeah. copying and pasting going on between <laughs> Wikipedia and the UNESCO site. Yeah, uh, yeah. And the UNESCO entry is, as I say, confuses as to numbers, as do, does the Wikipedia entry, as far as yeah, I can see. Yeah. Apart from yeah. that, in the burials, there have been finds of, of, uh, of daggers and uh, spears, uh, etc., um, but um, yeah, uh, apart from that, it's it's really really hard to say. Mm. Um, the four main areas um, that have been inscribed by UNESCO: uh, one are Sin in the Gaian, uh, Wasu, and the Kerbach uh, group of stone circles. So I think the mo- one that's most visited, are the Wasu um, uh, group, which doesn't actually have the most in it. I think that um, that um, it, well, it only has about nine or eleven stone circles in in that group. I think right. the area with the most is uh, Sinagayan, uh, which I think has got over fifty uh, stone circles in it. As I say, overall, um, one thousand and fifty three stone circles. If you include all the other monuments, it goes towards thirty thousand, which is quite a lot. Hence, <laughs> hence, uh, yeah. for, their, for their appearance, unique appearance, and the fact that there are so many of them, that's how they get onto our uh, 10 megalithic sites of the world you probably haven't heard of, whatever we're calling this. <laughs> <laughs> Enough. Let's, let's, uh, let's move on to the next one, shall we? Move on, yes. Okay. And from Gambia and Senegal, we're heading about 3,000 kilometres north to Morocco and the little-known site of Masura. It's an important burial that really must have looked quite something in its day, and it's the last remaining prehistoric site of its kind in this part of the world. Masura is a very large burial site uh, in northern Morocco, and to be honest, its design... It smacks more of places like Newgrange in Ireland. It's not that big, but uh, but it's design-wise, it's it's very similar. Mm. And this huge burial mound is surrounded by a ring of 167 stones, which is significant in anybody's book. And yeah. the average height of those uh, surrounding stones is about a metre and a half. So, you know, they're all, you know, substantial pieces of rock there. Now, there doesn't seem to be much consensus to the precise age of, mm. uh, of Masura, but uh, excavations, later excavations, actually in the 1950s, did turn up some uh, amphorae, which they dated to between the 4th and 3rd century BC. Now... Uh, Tourists. I beg your pardon? 
tourists. Well, you mean tourists bringing forth and said, well, it's quite possible. It is quite <laughs> possible. And, uh, and that's why, you know, so much of this stuff, without proper excavations, we'll <laughs> get into the actual excavation side of it uh, shortly, because yeah, that is sure. equally ridiculous. Um, but uh, th- any consensus that there is, is that this is Bronze Age. And the estimates have, have ranged everywhere from... 1800 years BC to 300 BC. So, uh, yeah. so the bottom line is old, but don't know. Um, yeah. <laughs> now, so it, uh, it's interesting that you introduced it as a as a burial mound. Mm. Um, in having a, a look around the the web, uh, that um, there aren't that many people that introduce it that way. It's always referred to as a stone circle. Yeah, but you're absolutely right to do so because the most prominent thing. <laughs> Is the mount? It's, it's probably too early to get onto the yeah. excavation point of view. Yeah. What's left of the mound, you know, is definitely like Newgrange or a another burial mound. I, I tell you what, it quite shocked me. I was watching one video. I can't remember where it was, and well, a I was surprised at how green it is. I don't know whether it was a particular time of year that the camera was approaching this. You know, the stone circle. Bit and you could see the mound rising behind, and I thought, flipping heck, I could be, I could be an island. <laughs> I could be. That's really, true. <laughs> it was astonishing. Yeah. There was very yeah. little to distinguish it from, you know, yeah. uh, anywhere European. Yes. Um, in that it's, regard, uh, well, apparently there were another couple of uh, of very similar sites in Morocco, which there's no trace of them to be found. Now, unfortunately, um, but they have based their thinking on the, the the fact that it would have contained burial chambers and what have you, on hmm. what they know about the other sites that were known about but are also no longer uh, visible in the landscape. It's all very hmm. frustrating. Um, now, uh, have you got to hand um, you know what the myth is? You know what the the uh, the folklore is. Well, about. there is folklore uh, that um, it's the the tomb of uh, Antaeus. Antaeus, that's um, the, I was thinking. Uh, yeah. uh, which yeah, it's it's most likely going to be every kind of nonsense. Antaeus was the giant in Greek mythology who he challenged all passers by to wrestling matches and. Um, and the the story goes that so long as he was connected to his mother, such as it is with Greek gods, um, so long as he was connected to his mother, who was the earth, that he was invincible. So he always killed the people that he uh, that he defeated. And uh, and there were stories that things were built from the skulls of his uh, opponents and. Uh, that sort of thing, but uh, so yeah. He, so he was, he was a big guy, <laughs> yeah. one of the big guys. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, did but, he uh, did he acquire god status? Um, uh, well, he it depends I mean, quite on the a claim story, to fame doesn't to it? Have... He but he was defeated by Heracles, wasn't he? I think that's the story. Uh, Heracles, Hercules, take your choice. Uh, Heracles and Hercules aren't the same person, are they? Uh, no, they're not. Um, but they're easy. To- but that's probably the story is just as mix and match as you want it to be. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's, it's a pretty good thing to be able to claim as a god uh, buried uh, just up the road. There. It's true. It is true. Uh, Who makes up yeah. these things? Um, I, well, the I, Romans knew about it as uh, well, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, we know that it's at least uh, at least that old nobody can mm. argue about that because the romans did actually write about it but um yeah. Yeah. Uh, i suppose we ought to say i mean uh, a couple of details though that the the mound itself uh now it's maximum height of six meters today now if you think that's at least two thousand yeah. years that could be it could actually be three and a half thousand years or so of potential yeah. slumping and erosion so how big that mound yeah. was when it was built no idea of uh, what that might have been but it imposing it's 58 meters long by 54 meters wide it's almost circular um mm-hmm. and 
in front of, facing what would presumably have been the entrance to the tomb, there is the tallest of the stones there called El Uted, which translates as the peg. And that is more than five metres in height. That's a big stone facing the uh, facing the entrance there, which, you know, again, it does so smack of some of the massive Irish tombs. Um, it's, and that's the tempting thing, isn't yeah. it? It's a route we... Yes, we mm, dare not, can, but we have to say We can, we can <laughs> point down that route, yes. but we can't go down it, I no, guess. No, we can't. No, we can't. <laughs> But uh, uh, the, the archaeology itself, and this is, it's almost painful. There was a Spanish archaeologist called uh, Cesar Luis oh, de Montalban. Yeah. Now, <laughs> he started excavating the site in 1935. His excavations were cut short when he was actually arrested during the Spanish Civil War. <laughs> so he never completed his excavations. He never published anything about his uh, excavations. There's no records of his excavations. All very shabby. Yeah, but boy, uh, did he leave a mark. Oh, yes, he did. Well, you can see from some of the pictures, he left a bit of a mess, really. But um, uh, mm. but then it was later in the 1950s that uh, uh, a chap called uh, Miguel Talado uh, took over, I say took over excavations, revisiting for proper excavations. yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, he excavated what was left of it um, and actually discovered another smaller ring uh, nearby of just 16 monoliths in the, uh, in the other ring. Um, but uh, the, the presumption, and it, it is a presumption, but it doesn't seem an unreasonable one uh, from what, uh, what he was finding, was that it, it probably did have the same sorts of burial chambers as the other two sites that I mentioned earlier that are now um, not there to be seen. In fact, if you yeah. if you do a, do a search for it just on the internet and you will draw oh, a total so blank. So sad. Yeah. So sad because you feel like there's could be so much to learn. Mm. Or you could at least say, oh, there is a link, or mm. rule it out completely. Yeah. As it is, as is so often, we're left with this flipping enigma yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that tempts us into ways of thinking um, yes. that would get us probably into a, a lot of trouble. Yeah. So, yeah. Very frustrating, so, but an, an astonishing sight, though. And Oh, uh, completely. Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, if some proper excavations were done now using more modern techniques, bearing in mind that the last excavations were, you know, over half a century ago, uh, yeah. it would be interesting to see if anything further could be gleaned. Uh, because it's, mm. it's, it's rare in as much as, uh, you know, of what's left in the landscape to find a site that is similar in a lot of ways to more recognisable sites further north, you know, across Europe. It's, that's a very mm. tantalising prospect. But as you said, we can't mm. go down that route. We can only point that way. Yeah, mm. yeah. Anyway, no, we've we've pointed you at Missouri, and that is our that's our kind of our job done, really. It in, is really can't respect. take um, any more of uh, uh, of anything definitive. That's uh, other than yeah. it's a, still an astonishing sight today. So uh, worth a visit. Yeah. Like so many times with <laughs> megalithic <laughs> sites, well, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, go figure. Yeah, make up with what you will. All right. <laughs> Move it on. And the prize for having the biggest dolmen in the world goes to not Ireland, not Wales, not even France. If you consider that this country also has the most dolmens in the world at 40,000, then it probably won't surprise you that the biggest dolmen in the world is in Korea. Yes, the biggest dolmen and the most dolmens. How could Korea not be on this list? <laughs> uh, to get to the point, the biggest dolmen in the world is the Gusan Dong Dolmen in the city of Kime, right down in the south of the Korean peninsula. It was discovered during a housing estate development in 2006 and is a tomb from the end of the Bronze Age, or at least the Korean Bronze Age, that's say about 300 BCE, with its capstan estimated to weigh 350 tonnes. That's a big capstan. What did we say the largest capstan at Dom and Domingo weighed? 
Uh, <laughs> that was something ridiculous, wasn't it? I was like, oh, do you know what? I don't remember. We two oh, two hundred tons. I think the, the biggest thing we tons. know was two hundred yeah. tons. So it's not quite twice as big, but that's just absurd. Yes, this one goes to eleven. What were they thinking? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 350 tonnes. I don't know if they're metric tonnes or if they're imperial tonnes, but, you know, it's close. A lot of tonnes. It's big, yeah. And here's the thing. A rectangular yard was built around it and the floors were covered with quite large paving stones. I think that paved area that you can see there is not part of the development. That is actual archaeology. So it's it's, it's quite a big area that's been laid Mm. out there. So straight off the bat, despite the you know, the raw, unrefined appearance of the capstan, there is a lot more sophistication going on here than in many of the common or garden variety dolmens that we may be used to in our end of northwestern Europe. Mm. Now, on top of that, like so many other uh, Korean dolmens, there are actual finds here that will eventually help to embellish further the narrative surrounding this site. Excavations at dolmens all over Korea have revealed bronze goods such as daggers, swords, bells, bells, yeah, that's... <laughs> bells, mirrors, uh, polished stone daggers and burnished pottery. Several tombs also contain jade or Amazonite beads. Um, bit of colour in there. Amazonite, well, it's turquoise, isn't it? Sort of turquoise colour. Amazonite, I do believe. So this is in stark contrast to our own homegrown dolmens in Ireland, Cornwall and Wales, for example, that are, well, much, much older for a start than the uh, Korean dolmens, but um, ours are sort of entirely bereft of those kinds of grave goods or other remains that might help confirm what their original purpose was with any kind mm. of certainty at all. Whereas here, here at the Gusan Dong dolmen, Seems we have intact pots and vases. I mean, that's astonishing. It's also also interesting that there's uh, that it, there's possibly more examples or, or, or burials, evidence of burials in the Korean dolmens than there are in a lot of the European dolmens. So that's oh, interesting in itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, I was going on to, to to say that, but as this excavation is still ongoing, there's very little detail to recount about the find. So I can't really expound mm. much further about you know the biggest dolmen um in the world it's just big right that's how it gets on the list <laughs> it's huge <laughs> but i think that the thing is it's it's also an opportunity to talk about the fact that korea has the most dolmens as we said did we mention that the korean peninsula has around 40,000 of them i think we No did. we haven't said that have we have we said that <laughs> it's just it's breathtaking isn't it it, yeah. doesn't, it almost doesn't make any sense really well, no, I, not only has it got um, the the most dolmens, but it's got a variety of dolmens as well. I mean, there there are big ones, small ones, obviously, um, but there are various types. I mean, there are two main stylistic types. It seems uh, there are the table type dolmens which are more common in the north, apparently, where the capstan is supported by two or more upright stones. And another type, which is seen more often in the south, as a single large stone covering a small rectangular stone-lined tomb, I suppose what we'd usually call a kist. Mm. Uh, and apparently the tomb at Gimhai, the, the, the biggest one, is of this type, which is why it's got the finds you know, in, in that kist. Um, there are other types, it seems, but I think uh, we'd get a bit into the weeds if we went down that route, examining every difference. <laughs> probably, yeah, probably. There does seem to be, a, or the, a, you know, a couple of different thought processes behind it. You know, it's either a, a great big, enormous but massive lump of stone <laughs> where the impressive thing is the sheer scale of it. Yeah. And then others that are very neat and tidy boxes that yeah. are uh, sort of more akin to what, we, uh, what we're what used to seeing yeah. um, in the West. But it is strange how that, you know, there's two very different 
Yeah, it's a sense of proportion. I mean, that it exemplifies it. The one that Kim, uh, Kim uh, exemplifies it, where you've got a you know, relatively small little kist and then this stonking great <laughs> yes. stone sort of balancing yeah. on, uh, on, on the top of it. I mean, yeah. you know, really how that works, I do not know. Mm. To be clear, <laughs> though, I mean, these are first millennium BCE monuments. In other words, at least two, probably 3,000 years later than um, yeah. our European dolmens. Mm. But what's fascinating is that they're a clear example of how the introduction of a settled agricultural way of life gives rise to hierarchical structures in larger communities and ultimately to an elite stratum that can command this kind of you know, monumentalization. Is that a word? Monumentalization, I think it is. Oh, I think it is now. At least. <laughs> uh, you know, this kind of it, interment and, and, and reverence through grave goods. Now, this way of life seems to have come late to Korea because the staple food supporting settled agrarian life in this part of the world is, of course, rice. However, here's the thing. Rice was never indigenous to Korea because the Korean peninsula has a cooler climate than necessary to the variety that was eventually grown there. It took hundreds of years for the Japonica variety to undergo the necessary adaptation to the colder conditions. Well, I didn't know that. No, but when it did, you know, boom, you, you got settled farming, huge population increase, lots of villages with village leaders who in turn, it seems, felt the need to be honoured with the biggest stones possible in some form or another. So to wrap up, so perhaps not the first region in the world, you'd instinctively go megalith hunting, but if you did, you would get a whole lot more than you bargained for. <laughs> yeah. Certainly would that. There's a, there's a complexity here that underlies the apparent simplicity of the structures themselves. There's the grave goods, the fact that human remains in them are quite common, that they sometimes occur in compact groupings and cemeteries, uh, and that they're sometimes arranged in straight lines. Though I'm not, I've not heard it suggested that these represent any kinds of celestial alignment. Um, but for now, that's about it. There you are, the largest dolmen in the world, and a very sketchy introduction to the world of Korean Bronze Age prehistory. Bet you didn't see that coming. <laughs> More whiplash, flying east now to Armenia and a remarkably extensive group of stones. Karunj is a seriously ancient site, some believe it to be around 7,500 years old, and it's believed to have been constructed as some kind of celestial observatory. Uh, now the site is huge, it extends to about 7 hectares, that's about 18 acres. And it's a sprawling megalithic site. Um, now, the name uh, Kurunj comes from two Armenian words, ka, which is stone, and hunj, or hunch in some pronunciation, uh, means sound. So this is interpreted as meaning the singing stones. And it's thought that the name comes from the way the wind whistles through the stones, which mm. it probably does at that altitude. Yeah. Um, speaking stones is another translation that's been given um, because there's holes bored in a lot of the stones uh, which uh, the wind whistles through. Uh, more of that shortly too. Uh, now, the Karunj Monument itself, if we can call it a single monument, we can't. It's sprawling yeah. lots of monuments. And the uh, the crux of it is that it consists of a central circle, and there's a northern arm, a southern arm, a northeastern alley. I don't know why they distinguish it as an alley, and a cord across the circle. And it's there are standing a cord, stones. A cord across the circle. I mean, yeah. So a, a cord is yes, it's a geometrical. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know what you mean. Um, but. Yeah, mm. um, it's just interesting that they distinguish it uh, in that sense when there are so many stones th throughout this complex. Yeah. Um, also interesting is that the uh, uh, throughout the complex there are a number of burial kists and individual menias. So there's stone rows, but isolated stones as well. Um, 223 stones in total have been identified, 
uh, many haven't been numbered. It's possible that there were more, but uh, they're unclear about that. Uh, heights of the stones, uh, they vary from half a metre to three metres tall. So from small to pretty big and the heaviest of them weighing up to 10 tons which again you know it's uh, a lot of work to bring these things to a mountain plateau uh, now about 80 of the stones have got circular holes bored through them uh, only 37 of these stones uh, are still standing there were 47 of them as far as they can tell there were 47 board holes 37 of them still standing um, and uh, th one of the things that gave rise to that very early date yep. is that some uh, archaeoastronomers looked at the holes uh, the alignments of the holes because they're bored like tubes through the uh, through the stones and they've looked at alignments to celestial objects and given it a date on on what they think the stones are aligned to. Uh, so Deneb in, uh, in the constellation of Cygnus is one of the principal ones where they're saying that through this hole you would have been able to see uh, Deneb at this time, seven and a half thousand years ago. Now, uh, archaeoastronomers like uh, the very great Clive Ruggles has said that uh, he, he doesn't agree with those findings at all. And uh, and I think we can't avoid the fact that uh, anything, you know, two stones or a, a, a or a hole through a stone, it's going to align with something. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, so you're cherry picking really what you, you know. So as you look through that hole and you see things passing through it throughout the night or throughout the year, are you just choosing what you think is the significant thing to give it a date? Yeah. And. Uh, you know, if you look at the the site overall from some of these pictures, uh, it, it seems stylistically, it seems more likely that it would be probably a couple of thousand years younger than that. I don't know what you think there, Michael. I'd say, you know, that five and a half, five thousand years old would make sense with uh, with that sort of uh, set of structures. Kind Seven of, kind of, you know, from our perspective, because we work on a, you know, a, a very a different band of the Neolithic than is going mm. on. And, you know, and Armenia almost counts as the Middle East because, you know, it's just, it's just up a bit, yeah. you know, it's not far from Turkey. Mm. No, and that <laughs> that that's the big one, isn't it? Yeah. Because we, we you know we look at these megalithic sites well over in the east. So you mentioned Turkey. So if you've got megalithic thinking, if you want to put it that way, gradually making its way west, then maybe that very old date is not so outrageous. Yeah. Um, but the truth is that we don't really know. No, uh, there's no other way of, uh, of doing it, is there? No, no, sadly. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's it's the fact that so that why did it get in the list? Because look <laughs> at the scale <laughs> of this site. <laughs> that many acres of that many standing stones. Uh, it it really is quite a staggering site, and it makes you wonder what was going on around and about. You know that yeah. there are kist burials um, uh, associated. You know all, all around the place. Here, so we don't know where the people were living uh, at the time. We don't know how uh, how society was structured around uh, around this massive place. Uh, but it is, yeah, very very significant, and mm -hmm. uh, and way over there in Armenia, there you are. What more can we say? Um, yeah, so the kists, there can be no, there are no dates from the kists, no remains. I haven't, I haven't found any dates from those. Not that um, that I think would it's give you a clue, because, you know, people often use pre-existing sites to uh, to honour their dead yeah. anyway, so that doesn't really help. And no sign of settlement mm. or anything like that? Where Where is no. the nearest place where people uh, were, were living we don't know uh, that no i mean we've got uh, there are there are uh, signs of uh, of other sites uh, lower down into the valleys but yeah. um 
Uh, but nothing, uh, certainly in my research, nothing that I've found uh, re- relating to uh, the burials and associated stuff here. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, also can't ignore the fact that when you're this high up on a mountain plateau in some fairly harsh weather conditions, yeah. it's quite possible that any signs of settlement that there may have been are long since eroded away. And it's just because, these, it's, as we find so often in uh, in Western Europe, that the signs of maybe the timber dwellings long since gone. So, so yeah. you know, maybe that's why. Maybe that's so, why. and also absence of, you know, confirmed alignments, well, according to Clive Ruggles, anyway. <laughs> mm. You can't ignore the, the deliberate drilling of holes, can you? <laughs> well, there's a, another argument uh, that uh, it might not be Ruggles who made this argument, but uh, but somebody was saying that the stones themselves are fairly eroded, yeah, but the holes through the stones are still, you know, they're still very cylindrical holes bored okay. through, and so there is debate as to whether the uh, the holes are actually as old as the rest of the site, you know, were they actually drilled through at whatever period in later history than the actual construction of the site? Again, no way of knowing. No, For it's sure. it's an interesting uh, interesting thought. Though. Yeah. Um, well, I hope if you've never heard hmm. of Karunge before, which is not how it looks spelt on the page, has to be said. <laughs> no, Karahunge, Karahunge is Karahunge. the way it is spelt, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, but if you've never heard it before, I hope that's piqued your I- interest. Uh, it, it's one of the most extensive sites, and that's how it gets on the list, but it's also one of the mysterious, yeah. you know, from what you... Yes. Who knows anything yes. about it? It's yes, it would be crazy. lovely if it was seven and a half thousand years old, wouldn't it? It, um, it would. So, well, you never know. We may yet find out. Yes. We always like pushing dates back, don't we? (laughs) We do. We (laughs) do. Part of the fun. (laughs) Shall we move on? Let's do that. A little closer to home now, and to an area that has a big part to play in the story of the Neolithic in Northwest Europe, the Mediterranean. There are many places we could have chosen to illustrate the importance of the sea routes taken by the first farmers, the islands of Sardinia, Menorca, Mallorca, Sicily even. But we're going to Malta. Uh, yes, Malta, and more specifically to the site of Hajaim, a megalithic temple complex dating from 3600 to 3200 BCE. Did you know, Rupert, that the complex has been claimed... Uh, as the oldest freestanding structure on Earth until the discovery of Gebekli Tepe. I did not know that. Um, yeah. It doesn't altogether surprise me, but no, I didn't know that at all. No, Gebekli Tepe mm. hadn't been discovered, but, you know, when uh, it was fir- the uh, uh, Hajaim was first being talked about. There are three uh, structures in the uh, in the whole complex, but the, the the main one, the one that everybody goes to to see, is the one that's been sort of reconstructed. Mm. But we're here. We've come to Hajaim simply to because to quote the World Heritage Sites Committee, it is a unique architectural masterpiece um that and the fact that it's genuinely a megalithic site i mean we are talking about huge stones here maybe not on the scale of the dolmen de Menga that we were looking at earlier but um i think what it lacks in in sheer tonnage it makes up for in complexity Mm. Um, and of course, here again, we're predating Stonehenge, Newgrange, and of course the pyramids. So, um, taken all together, we're almost certainly looking at one of the oldest temple co- complexes in the world, which is a bit surprising <laughs> to hear coming from us because mm. many of you may know that <laughs> Rupert and I are you know, quite wary of. Uh, of the habit that many archaeologists have of of labelling almost all megalithic sites as temples or sacred in some way, but in mm. this case, we'd have to say that the um, the evidence does point in that direction. It's like, very difficult you know, to other... see it in any other way, isn't it? Really? Yeah, especially yeah. with the other temple sites on uh, on Malta, um, mm. Hajarim being uh, uh, w- just one of six um, similar sites all over Malta. Mm. So, I mean, the evidence for it being uh, a temple site 
uh, is stone statuary um, found there, which has been um, uh, uh, sort of identified as uh, fertility idols. Um, there are solar alignments. There, there are the remains of sacrificial, sacrificial animals. That's a dead giveaway, isn't it? And, yeah. Uh, and stone altars that may, may not have been sacrificial altars. Um, you know, that's an unusual thing. Uh, and combined with the fact that there haven't actually been any human remains found there, i.e. it's definitely not a burial site, um, mm. taken all together, that helps confirm that interpretation. Um, also, inside the complex, I mean, I think immediately, you know, if you go in the front door, <laughs> le immediately left and right, there are sort of little recessed doors that once upon a time had screens across them, um, which uh, it, uh, you can tell by, by the little drilled holes either side of the doors, which once held the ropes to hold the, the screen in place, something like that. And, um, uh, and some have suggested that those rooms may have been uh, rooms for oracles, used by oracles. Um, I mean... The crazy thing is there is so much detail to this site that we can only begin to scratch the surface here, <laughs> if that. I'll tell you one fascinating detail is that there is a hole that is deliberately carved into one of the exterior stones that enables the room on the other side, on the inside, to be illuminated on the summer solstice. But curiously, the, the light as it comes in, it beams in, it f forms the shape of a half moon as it first strikes the, as it strikes an upright slab wow. just adjacent to the door. And, there, and then, as it, then it fills out as it moves down to the floor and becomes more, more circular. So that's completely unique. Is that, yeah. is that, the, is that the moon and the sun? being conjured by priests into the same space. That's it's, <laughs> remarkable, isn't it? That is tan remarkable. It is yeah. tantalising, yeah. Mm. Um, so it's one of those places where, you know, the imagination goes crazy, imagining, you know, what people were actually up there, up, up to there. And you've got statuary. I think I mentioned the statuary, um, you know, quite large-ish, uh, uh, shall we say, rotund figures. Yes, let's say rotund. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Let's say r rotund, mm. which people have automatically leapt to the conclusion that they're, they're female figures. But if you look at them, there's only one that has breasts mm. um, that, that cut, carved in. And she's not particularly fat compared to the others. The others are not specifically really uh, female. So there's another thing to, to conjure with. Are we, are we seeing... You know what our priests look like in that place. I don't know. That's you know that's completely off the top of my head. Anyway, um, but it just shows though with interpretation as a whole. Um, mm. You know that that everything that we look at prehistorically. You know that if if it's not written down, then we don't know for sure. And it's a, <laughs> and it's a matter of how do you interpret any of these things. And it's true when they found these rotund carvings of people it's generally thought to be fertility goddesses or you know yeah, um, yeah. mother earth kind of uh, kind of figures and and all right in in most cases there's not really much uh, dispute about that but as you say mm. here interesting you know it, could you be looking at a uh, the same thing that we had during the renaissance period for example where uh, where when somebody was fat that it was actually regarded as a sign of wealth and uh, uh, that sort of positivity. It, uh, you know, it's I'm going off on one, but it's yes, actually, you, are. you know, <laughs> but it's possible that uh, you know, stay in your lane, thing Rupert, stay in your lane, 10 megalithic <laughs> sites, okay? Uh, yeah, indeed, <laughs> indeed. Um, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a good talking point for another time, maybe. But there are, there are other amazing equinox and summer solstice phenomena incorporated into the design of the complex, which is also um, precisely aligned towards a, a little island called um, Filfla, 
which is about three miles out to sea. I mean, it's precisely al aligned, you know, with the pa central um, passage there. So I don't know if we've got something similar going on to uh, on with the uh, Dom of the Manga, which pointed at that um, hill thing in the middle of the plateau, uh, of the um, plateau in, in front of it. Mm, um, interesting. Who knows? Mm. Uh, but you know, I don't know. I, I don't know when to stop, Rupert, with this one. <laughs> well, it, it's one of those that I think the most important thing for our purposes here is to flag mm. up the site for for uh, for people to go and have a look at because. You know, if you want to go into the minutiae of uh, uh, mm -hmm. of the site, yeah, we'd be here for a month. Um, we would. It, it's yeah. uh, it's astonishing the uh, the complexity of the site overall. Mm -mm -mm. One last thing before we leave it: if you're looking at some of the photographs I've shown, you're wondering about that ugly canopy over the top of it. Yeah, it probably does spoil the ambience somewhat, but that is essential protection because the local limestone. Uh, it is is very very soft, and mm. uh, the stuff that the limestone that's been exposed that was never sort of buried is severely eroded, and to protect the rest of the site, and that canopy has been um, put over it. Anyway, mm. I th I think we're done here. I think we're done here. Yes, I think I think it's your turn next. Okie dokie. Next up, we're heading all the way over to Portugal and to probably the largest group of menhirs in the Iberian Peninsula. In fact, one of the largest in the whole of Europe. Almendres in the Evora region of Portugal is a complex site and it was probably in use for a very long time. Off to Portugal. And more specifically, uh, the, the site that we're talking about now, Almandres, is uh, it's about 100 miles east of Lisbon, just to you know, give you a, a, a rough area for it. So it's sort of south of, of central Portugal. Um, and the site was rediscovered in the 60s by an Enrique Leonor Pina when he was carrying out geological field work for mapping and the like. And uh, this is an extraordinary site. Uh, it's, a, it's just under 100 granite monoliths and they vary in height from fairly small to the tallest one being uh, 10 foot tall or so and uh, what's make what makes this site really quite unusual is that these this huge uh, collection of monoliths were actually constructed over in three phases over 3,000 years or more the earliest phase goes back to nearly 6,000 years ago Really? Uh, Do you know uh, what? Uh, I mean, I thought I knew this and, uh, you know, you saying that. It stretches over 3,000 years. I thought, well, yeah, three stages over a few through, few hundred years. I didn't, yeah. I genuinely, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. It's uh, it, it's so unusual because you, you have to ask the question. So they've got um, the first, the earliest phase uh, was roughly uh, – the they're saying oldest possibly. It hasn't been solidly dated, but roughly dated. Mm. So between five and 6,000 years. Yeah. Uh, and then the second phase between four and 5,000 years. And the final phase between three and 4,000 years. Oh, so it's an, it is a hugely old site. And of course, the question is always there with this sort of situation of, well, was it used constantly over that whole period of time with tweaking at those distances in you know in time or did people come back to it and make changes yeah. uh, to use it for something else was it lost in the woods for thousands of years and people well, stumbled across it and what it, what it, what? it, what? it begs the what question. is this <laughs> it begs the question and uh, and the thing is to, to go back in those phases so so almendris one so we're talking about say five and a half to six thousand years old, and um, now it's basically just two and a bit concentric circles of monoliths. Then leap forwards to stage two, a thousand years roughly later on, mm -hmm. and uh, and they built this huge elliptical uh, arrangement. Uh, again, concentric uh, uh, monoliths of this huge ellipse, which is just to the northwest of the um, uh, of the original concentric circles. 
stage three was they were just tweaking with uh, with the alignments. <laughs> it wasn't a fundamental change. It was tweaks. Um, now, it, it, it's for me, the confusing thing is when you look at the tweaks, uh, because a lot of the stones have been, uh, uh, they'd fallen over and, uh, and it was clearly visible where the sockets had been. So they were uh, re-erected. And looking at the uh, the stage three arrangement, which is not hugely different, it's mm. just tweaked. So what were they doing there? There's one monolith in particular, which is stone eight, I think, off the top of my head, I can't remember. It's, uh, I think it's in the second stage. But um, this um, monolith number eight, it's cut off at uh, chest height, so flattened at chest height, with lots of dimples in it. Uh, it looks like a you know a game that you'd play marbles with. But they believe, when I say they, archaeologists believe, that if you're using the site, uh, the overall complex, for astronomical purposes, astronomical observations, that by moving a pebble from uh, uh, from dimple to dimple, that you could use that for different alignments throughout the site. It's, uh, it's certainly very compelling uh, when you look at it in relation to uh, the rest of the site, that, you know, is that what they were doing? Mm -hmm. you, you, ha you have this uh, a division of thought, if you like, between researchers that some think that it's a religious site, some think it's an astronomical observatory of 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 whatever sort, I suspect that it's the two. I don't yeah. think uh, you know it's it, it's only in comparatively recent history that we have separated out religion and science. Anyway, haven't we? Um, mm. That uh, it particularly if you're looking at a site where you can uh, you can see uh, alignments to whether it's equinoxes or, or solstices that uh, that for those to have been religious. Uh, uh, periods would be uh, not surprising at all. So uh, I think mix the two together and we're looking at, at science and astronomic uh, observation and religious uh, functions as well. Interestingly, there is an outlier. There is uh, one of the tallest uh, monoliths in the entire complex, if we can say that it's in the entire complex, which is, uh, it's a, about, <coughs> excuse me, it's about a mile, roughly, oh. um, away that from the complex outlier. to yeah. the... Uh, of, it's an extreme outlier to the northeast. And if you take a line through the centre of the complex uh, going towards this monolith, mm. then it apparently... Uh, it aligns roughly. It's not exact. It aligns roughly with the site on uh, the sunrise on the winter solstice. Mm. Now, mm. I've got to be honest, I think that it being that far away and the fact that it's only roughly towards the sunrise on the winter solstice, I just think it's a coincidence and nothing to do with the site at all. Uh, that's really? just a personal opinion. Yeah, it's for me, if, if it's... Well, would you say the same about the cuckoo stone? I think I'm talking right at Stonehenge. That's always incorporated into the... It's, it's not a mile away, though, is it? It's long. It's quite a long way away. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't. I, I don't know the figure, but anyway, I've probably I've, I've bowled you a googly there. Sorry. You have bowled me a googly. <laughs> uh, well, the, the thing is, if it's so, it's a, to be more exact, it's one thousand four hundred meters mm. away. That's a long way. Yeah, and, it is. Uh, if if you're going to say that at the time that landscape was completely clear for a mile, then okay, fair enough. But mm. you only need a few bushes in the way and you can't see it anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so I don't know. Oh, but sorry. Uh, uh, bowling a googly, by the way, is a cricketing term. And oh, <laughs> Yeah, actually, well thought. Yes. Well thought. Yes, probably. <laughs> uh, and uh, yes. refers to how the bowler may uh, flatten the trajectory of the ball so it lands exactly in the crease there something you didn't know okay do you know do you now want to define crease 
Okay, it's where the batsman. Wit. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, uh, no, that's too dangerous. It is. Yeah, crick- cricket metaphors. There you go. It it's is, hiding it is. to nowhere. Um, but I, I think uh, you know. Again, uh, it's we don't need to uh, bang on at length about this. It's just from the point of view of. An extraordinary collection of monoliths, you know, mm. as I said, nearly a hundred monoliths that have been put together to align with uh, whichever astronomical uh, uh, periods and phases this mm. may have been. There, there is some suggestion that that you have both solar and uh, lunar alignments yeah. Yeah. Uh, here, uh, um, which, you know, it is pretty complex. Uh, so certainly do look it up as a place to visit if you get a chance to go to uh, Almendras, uh, to Portugal, to to visit the site. Well worth a visit. The, the monoliths, although in fact similar to um, uh, Ajaim that you were talking about in Malta, that although these are granite, they are uh, also heavily eroded, yeah. uh, which is no surprise for yeah. uh, that well, length of that time. That erosion seems to have taken away some um, designs on the surface which are barely decipherable well they're not decipherable yeah, but the, they're barely visible now is that the, there's carving uh, on on various uh, hmm. stones uh, and not a huge amount of them I don't remember exactly how no, it's many not. Yeah. Uh, it's it's a it's a minority of uh, of stones yeah, so there's not a lot of play made carved. about them because there's no way of knowing what they're for and they're but pretty it's, faint. It's, it, it, it's like, uh, you know, it's similar to, say, you know, the axes carved uh, on, the, uh, yeah. on the stones at Stonehenge. It's when which you have no idea mm. when they were done. You know, somebody could have come along and carved those on as, if you like, <laughs> Mason's graffiti a, a thousand years after the stones had fallen into disuse. You have no idea at all. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so, yes, Interesting that they're there, but we don't really know uh, at what period they might uh, might apply to. Uh, but yeah, there you go. There okay, you go. it's a, a three phase site that spreads over three thousand years. Very well reported, sir. And uh, it, it, we're <laughs> we're heading to the big finish now. Um, yeah, we are. I'm, I'm going to give you a bit of light relief uh, next as as we sort of take it down a bit and then build up for uh, the big finish at the end. Uh, it's number big. ten. But you probably worked out what it is anyway. But anyway, <laughs> onward, onward to the next one. So we're coming to the big finish now. But before we do that, we'd like to pay a visit to one of the Nordic countries. Norway, Sweden and Denmark have masses of megalithic monuments. But for something a little bit different, something that we include, if only because it looks so pretty, we hope you'll agree that it would have been rude not to include Alice Stenar. Yeah, it's a little bit of a palate cleanser here before we get to the the, the big finish. <laughs> and uh, this site, Alastana, uh, gets included, I think, mostly because it, it's beauty, actually. It's it's simplicity and it's uh, elegance. Um, it's a ship. It's a stone ship. It doesn't fit into the sequence of the great prehistoric megalithic monuments so much because, uh, I suppose, relatively, it, it is quite recent. Um, the best dates that are put on it are between 500 and uh, 1,000 CE, AD, whichever you like. Um, but I think more precisely, they th- um, through carbon dating, they've managed to put a date of five, um, 550 uh, CE. As I said, obviously the shape of it puts it inside the tradition of the uh, Nordic stone ship monument, which are usually associated with burials. Um, however, there's not a much, not a vast amount to write home about in those terms. Uh, like I said, it, it's here mostly because it looks nice. And unfortunately, there isn't mm. a great deal for us to say. Um, about its a- actual history, purpose, all those kinds of, of things. Because the although there are excavations been done, the results have been pretty lightweight. <laughs> Can I put it that way? Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> um, true. I think the, the impressive thing is, because as you said, you know, it's in the list because it's such an impressive and contrasting 
uh, site, mm-hmm. you know, that you can't ignore a site where you look at the stones forming the outline of a ship and they're like five tonnes a piece. They really put some work into oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. putting this site together. Yeah. And they're not local either, some of them, are they? Uh, n- no, I think uh, I think it's seen quoted up to eight. They came from up to eighteen miles away, which is imp- which. When you think uh, compared to megalithic sites, say particularly in Britain, I don't think there's any site in Britain where any of the stones have been transported more than ten miles. That is true. That is very true. So, yeah. uh, so you know, as a contrast, they, they they clearly had a reason for doing what they did. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the controversy around it seems to be, um, uh, and while I mentioned, I haven't mentioned exactly where it is, right down on the southern tip of uh, of Sweden, where, where it pokes out into the the Baltic Sea down there, uh, quite near near to Bornholm, actually. Not far from Bornholm, is the island in the You've been the there. Baltic. I have been there, yes. Only just realised I'd been sort of <laughs> in that vicinity and didn't realise it. Um, it the, the, I wouldn't say it's controversy, but the confusion is, you know, about what it's for. And with one, you know, there was evidence of a burial, but it was some ashes in a pot. What do you think? Well, that's, mm. um, when you think about uh, great Viking burials with uh, <laughs> flames and ships yeah. going up in flames and things like that, there isn't doesn't seem to be much evidence of that kind of grand gesture burial thing going on. We've got a pot with some cremated um, remains in there, and that's what yeah, gives yeah. the date. Uh, there was, but there is evidence of of something else that goes back much further, which. Mm, some people like to claim has connections with with the ship, but the fact that the ship, uh, stone ship, and I suppose the fact that the stone ship is adjacent to these rather uh, older uh, remains um, is, uh, and we're going back five thousand five hundred years, you know, so that's quite a considerable yeah. amount. Uh, I think that was just the evidence for some foodstuffs. Associated with the pot, roughly, but you can't depend mm. upon that um, for anything. So um, it's impossible to say, isn't it, whether they were using the same site because the site had always been important for whatever reason, yeah. or it's just sheer coincidence that uh, you know there was a, a burial from however many thousand years previous. Uh, it's you know it's 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 very it's a fine line, isn't it? Really, yeah. Yeah. We don't know. So yeah. most likely associated with a burial, um, g- mm. given the, the evidence. Um, but, of course, are the other claims, not that they're exclusive, um, mutually exclusive, uh, that it um, is aligned with the summer solstice and the lunar standstill. Um, you know, surprise, surprise. Uh, mm. <laughs> uh it's uh, it's almost taboo not to align your monument or building you know, with, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with uh, some aspect of the sun's movement uh, through the, the skies. Um, but apart from that, it's not really a mount to save her. But look at how beautiful it is. What a Indeed. One- I, I, do you know what? There's, there's one interesting observation I would make, and that's because the Vikings, you know, this is classified as a Viking ship burial, and... Uh, there are Viking burials, ship burials, you know, they they covered a, a fair range. And there are some on the Isle of Man, which is uh, not a vast distance away when the Vikings were doing their travelling around. And uh, the interesting thing is that you look at the, the Viking ship burial, as the, the most famous one is at Balladool on the Isle of Man. Mm. And uh, the boulders that form the... Uh, the the shape of the, the the ship itself, in comparison with uh, Alistair, they're small. You know, they're yeah. they're too heavy to put in a wheelbarrow, but but not much. You know, they so it's and it's possible that that's just because that's all that was available. But you you look at the difference, this real contrast of these five ton blocks in Sweden mm. compared to these small. Yeah. Uh, uh, rocks used for this so, so it, I, for me that just came up as an interesting contrast okay. when it's around the same period okay 
Well, yeah, so. I uh, so mm. there we are, uh, Alice Denner. Uh, I omitted the statistics. Mm. Um, it's uh, sixty-seven meters long. That's two hundred and twenty foot. Um, Fifty-nine of those large boulders, uh, as we said, uh, weighing about it's big five tons each. Not to be messed with. Not to be messed with. Mm. Um, but there it is. You know, wonderful place to yeah. visit in, if you're in that part of the uh, the world. But with that said, I think it's time for all that uh, aforementioned big finish. Um, and uh, for that, I'm going to <laughs> yes. hand over to you, Mr. Soskin. Last and not least in the slightest, our final stop is probably the prehistory guy's favourite site in the whole world. Callanish, on the island of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides off the west coast of Scotland, is the most remarkable display of astronomical knowledge and accuracy of construction that you'll find anywhere in the prehistoric world. Uh, it has to be said, there's just so much information about Callanish that uh, I'm going to be referencing my notes because if it just came out, as a, we'd be here all day. <laughs> there is so much. <laughs> And uh, the main thing to be aware of, I suppose, at the beginning is that 5,000 years ago, this was a very, very busy place. Now, the site that, uh, if you're familiar with it already, but the site that we're specifically talking about is Callanish 1, uh, there are actually a further 18 sites around Callanish, uh, not far from the main site. Stone circles, stone rows... Uh, sections of circles, uh, so arcs of circles, all sorts of sites. That you know, this was a busy place, and the site that we're talking about, Callanish One, it's basically a you could call it an observatory of uh, of a sort. But we'll get onto that in a minute to give you the, the the main aspects of the site. If you're looking at it from the sky then its shape is pretty much like a Celtic cross. At the southern end, there is a circle, a stone circle, 13 stones that form a circle that is 41 feet in diameter. Um, now, this is probably very bad of me that we're probably talking about metres half the time and, <laughs> uh, and feet in others. So I'll apologise for that. You can do the calculations and conversions yourself. Um, but the stone circle uh, then has uh, rows radiating from it. So coming from the north, the longest row is actually an avenue that stretches down from the north to the circle. And then there are single stone rows coming out to the south, the east and the west. Now, in the centre of the circle, there is a passage tomb or a chambered tomb rather. And next to that, so slightly off centre, is a tall uh, monolith that it's 16 feet tall so it's a significant stone right in the center of the circle but the main reason that it is our favorite site anywhere is that up at that latitude uh, it's uh, it's basically where the extremes of the full lunar cycle of 18.6 years become something really quite different the moon at at, at the extremes of its full cycle, the moon seems to skirt the horizon. And at Callanish, from the main site, so from the circle itself, you can see the moon skirt the mountains on the island in the distance, and, uh, and the moon then finishes its passage by seeming to uh, come into the, uh, the, the stones themselves. We actually made a film about that. When we did the film Standing with Stones, which is quite a long time ago now, <laughs> um, so it would be nice to show you the sequence that we made for that uh, because it does show you the complexity of uh, of the site as a whole where you've got angles cut in the stones for example that uh, we don't know what alignments they might have been for but they all seem to be for astronomical observation of some sort and we talk about that in this sequence culminating with um, when uh, Michael actually got the software to see how the sky would have appeared at the time to make sure that it was absolutely accurate to uh, how the moon would appear to travel through the stones. 
and uh, so we'll show you that so you can see that uh, uh, that whole sequence of, uh, of Kalanish from a few years ago now. I've been waiting to come here for years and actually being here is more breathtaking than I ever imagined. No photograph can capture the sheer majesty of the place. It's a work of Neolithic wonder. Greater even than the astronomical brilliance of the recumbent stone circles, Kalanish is the greatest prehistoric observatory of them all. Situated on the Hebridean island of Lewis, I think it's utterly implausible that it was built by the islanders themselves simply for local use. Indeed, one of the enduring legends of Kalanish is that it was built by black men who came from over the sea. There is a burial cairn here, but it was added long after the stones were erected, and lacking the stone altar of the recumbents, the implication is that this was a place of science rather than religion. The full lunar cycle of 18.61 years is marked and predicted by these monoliths, but here the wider horizon is the stage. Just once in each cycle the moon seems to come down from the sky to touch the earth, disappearing behind the hills, only to reappear in a final display gleaming between the central stones as it passes. We've only scratched the surface of its alignments. Here the intricacy is so complete the impression is one of a finely tuned clock marking the slow but predictable movement of the heavens. Throughout the site, notches and angles are cut into the stones, refining the accuracy and marking certain celestial events. The focus at Kalanish of marking the full lunar cycle brings another point to mind which is relevant to many sites throughout the British Isles. The closest you can get to marking 18.61 in stones is 19, the number of stones in many sites, especially in Cornwall, and the closest you can get to marking half that number is 9. Other many circles of 9 stones are slightly less accurate version of the same phenomenon, and do the wider spaces between stones which we so often interpret as entrances actually mark a deliberate offset to adjust the inaccuracy of the circle. To me, the insistence on describing the builders of these extraordinary sites as animal skin wearing farmers is like saying that Britain's motorway system was built by shoppers. Up here, almost at the end of my journey, it brings to mind that I began working on this project about eight years ago. I've driven about 8,000 miles across the British Isles and I've no idea how far I've walked. Wouldn't surprise me if it was about 800. Fate must be on my side because without any deliberate planning and through constantly shifting weather-dependent schedules, I've arrived here five hours before a lunar eclipse. I said right at the beginning of the film that it's only by being here, standing with these ancient stones, that we can truly begin to get a sense of what they were all about. I've found over all the miles and the monuments that our forebears were so far removed from the insular communities of our imagination. And arriving here accidentally to be here on the night of a full lunar eclipse, it really does make me appreciate the mystical qualities that seem to have been so important to our ancestors. Well, 
Well, uh, uh, that that brings back some memories, doesn't it? Uh, just what ha- happy days, eh? Happy days. Well, I'm reminded, you know, why <laughs> Kalanish is uh, our favourite. Um, I, I think there are reasons we probably don't have the time to go in for now, but there were so many, you know, special moments associated with our time uh, being at, at Cambridge, yeah. the fact that the weather smiled on us and our timing was so right. And as you mentioned, that perfect thing, as you mentioned, in the film itself, <laughs> arriving there on the uh, night of the lunar eclipse. Uh, uh, astonishing, astonishing, you know, on a personal level. Yeah. But... Uh, it's up there in yeah. the Hebrides, you know, so it's uh, something you have to consider if you want to visit the site. It's uh, uh, a little bit of a trek, it, a little bit yes. of an effort to uh, to get it's there. It's worth it, though. But so, so worth it. How mm. so? Anyway, I think um, now is the time to uh, say goodbye. Um, that is, that's it. That is our... Uh, ten most somethingist uh, megalithic monuments that uh, aren't <laughs> Stonehenge or Gebekli yeah. uh, Tepe. I really hope you've enjoyed that. We've enjoyed putting it together, haven't we, Rupert? It's sort of... Uh, um, uh, you know, we have, yeah. yes. Yeah. You should see the list of the ones that we didn't include. Oh, my goodness gracious <laughs> me, yeah. Uh, when are we mm. going to find time to include those at some mm. point in, in the future? Um, if you know, uh, I'm sorry if your favourite site hasn't got on our list there. Do let us know you know what are your favorites and uh, if you'd like us to do more in the future along this kind of uh, line with uh, ancient monuments uh, do let us know um so oh that's it great thanks for watching uh don't forget to like and subscribe hit the little bell etc and uh, if you've enjoyed this please do take a, a look at the other stuff we've got on our site uh, um you know films and uh, our podcast video podcasts and uh, talking head stuff, uh, all of that. There's loads built up over the past few years, isn't there? <laughs> yep, uh, there really is. Yes, uh, the portfolio is getting bigger all the time. Uh, yeah, and don't forget to have a look at our Patreon page as well if you uh, want uh, some of the other content that we do just for our Patreon subscribers. So, uh, for sure. Yeah. Well said. All right. <laughs> That's it. Bye for now. Thanks, folks. See ya. Bye.